Okay, uh, I'd like to um, call the, uh, the session uh, into uh, being here. So um, this is a session on uh, does the left silence about controlled demolition promote on 9-11 promote uh, Islamophobia. Um, so um, my name is uh, Wayne Costi. I'm a volunteer with Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Um, I've been involved in uh, uh, talking about uh, what actually happened to the Twin Towers and Building 7. <laughs> Uh, for uh, about five years now. Um, I'm not just a, a normal volunteer. I've been at this long enough uh, and uh, apparently been doing well enough so that I'm uh, on the congressional outreach team. And if you want to see members of Congress uh, run, uh, start talking about 9-11. You probably all know that. Um, I'm also on the presenters team. Uh, I've, so I, I've given a number of talks and uh, most recently I've uh, been elected to the board of directors. So. Um, uh, when uh, David uh, makes some comments about the board, um, um, it's, he, he's uh, going to be uh, um, uh, talking about the entire board and not me in particular. Uh, so, at any rate, um, we're here because uh, Noam Chomsky says the responsibility of intellectuals is to speak the truth and expose lies. However, he and most leading uh, commentators uh, on the left and on the right uh, refuse to call out the U.S. Uh, government about the contradictions and falsehoods about 9-11. The falsehoods are clear and visible to anyone who looks. The silence has left the false story that Arab Muslim hijackers were the 9-11 culprits. The, uh, <clears throat> what these commentators do not acknowledge is that uh, this cover story does not hold up to scrutiny. The story resulted... The story resulted, from an, um, uh, resulted in an increased institutionalization of Islamophobia uh, and, um, and left the key basis of the subsequent wars unquestioned. Um, how can the left move forward while leaving behind those suffering from the consequences of 9-11 deceptions? Um, Robert McElvain will be joining us. Uh, uh, he's one of the most visible family members, um, uh, uh, especially during the period uh, following 9-11. Uh, he will describe his personal journey. Uh, these presentations uh, bring up the question of who is more anti-fascist, the 9-11 truth movement uh, or the left? So um, that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, and so the, uh, uh, my credentials here are, uh, I'm a, first of all, I'm a professional, licensed professional engineer with over 30 years of professional experience. I have a a Bachelor of Science degree in electrical engineering, not a structural engineer, but what they did teach us in school was that the laws of physics apply every day, every day. Uh, no days <laughs> off. Um, and so my degree was electrical, electrical engineering from the University of Connecticut, um, and I've really been involved with this uh, fairly actively since 2009, 2010. Uh, and um, I, I uh, will be joined here with uh, David Schlesinger, who was a 9-11 truth activist. Um, Dave was radicalized uh, in the early 1970s at MIT by none other than Noam Chomsky, amongst others. Um, he uh, has been arrested in civil di disobedience uh, around 30 times. He served four months in jail in 1982 in New Hampshire over the Seabrook Nuclear Station oh, yeah. um, for Gandhian-style civil disobedience, where uh, he uh, uh, pleaded guilty, told the judge that he did not seek leniency, uh, did not use a lawyer. Um, first. Um, or at least among the first people to serve time uh, for a sentence for civil disobedience over the building of the Cliffside Coal Plant in North Carolina. Uh, we'll also be joined by Bob McElvain, uh, who has uh, been investigating and speaking out about the murder of his son, Bobby, since 9-11 happened. Uh, Bobby McElvain was 26 years old on that day. He was killed at the World Trade Center. According uh, to uh, 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 Bob, uh, he was uh, um, working at the Merrill Lynch and died instantly from an explosion as he walked into the North Tower. Uh, and the injuries, um, and I believe the timing, are not consistent with the official story. So what I'm going to do, the way that we're going to structure this is I'm going to um, give a, uh, a high-level overview of the, the physical evidence of what happened on 9-11. And uh, to do that, um, uh, I have a, about a, 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 about a, a ten-minute little um, thing that I'm going to walk you through. Um, and I don't know if you can dim the lights, but uh, well, the first thing we're going to do is look at a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, the built uh, WTC7 um, and uh, known controlled demolition. 
Um, and what we see here is uh, Building 7 on the left coming down and a known controlled demolition on the, on the right. Um, CBS News with Dan Rather um, uh, this, uh, talked about the Building 7 said it looked like a known controlled demolition. Uh, those buildings that, we, that have been brought down with, uh, with uh, uh, well-placed dynamite. Um, and in fact, uh, 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 these, build these uh, videos were never shown again after, um, after September 11th. Uh, only one day uh, on, on uh, one or two uh, showings and that was it. Never again. Um, uh, so, well, if the official cause is a small fire in one corner that heated up some beams, that pushed a girder, uh, uh, put some pressure on a girder, that broke some bolts. Now, uh, what we're going to see here is that this finite element analysis, this is a, the, and you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, this building that is uh, designed to be um, uh, withstand uh, structural, um, uh, 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 some level of seismic activity is just crumbling if, as if it's held together by, by bubble gum. And it seems like my, this is running very slowly right now. Um, it's in slow motion. Um, it's supposed to go a lot faster. Um, uh, this is uh, another, uh, uh, this provided uh, several different uh, simulations. This one here uh, is, uh, has no de debris damage. The other one was, uh, 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 had, the first one had some debris damage. And this is a uh, building seven coming down. Um, boy, it's slow. Um, and so uh, if you want to know what a gravity-only collapse looks like, uh, we're, the friends have a technique called veronage that uh, will pull out the middle, uh, middle of the building and uh, uh, the top will crush the bottom, and it starts always starts in the middle because uh, uh, every floor that is uh, destroyed on, uh, below is uh, uh, destroys a, a floor above it. Um, this one here, the thing I want you to look at is uh, you're going to see some materials being ejected out. This is now this is really in slow motion, real slow motion now, and you're going to see some materials being ejected out, and they're going to be coming down, and you'll see them falling, and they're going to be going like this one here. This one's falling and you can see it's going much much faster than the roof line because it takes energy to uh, crush the building that takes time um, and compared to something in free fall um, uh, whatever's uh, in free fall uh, that's not being held up is gonna is gonna come down it creates a nice little tidy rubble uh, pile and what we're gonna see with the Twin Towers is that uh, you're not gonna have a tiny rubble pile and you're gonna see the demolition proceeding faster than the um, uh, uh, things are falling in free fall uh, people say it can't, uh, Twin Towers can't be a controlled demolition because they always start at the bottom. Well, this one here started, started at the top. Uh, this next one here is going to start in the middle. It's going to look an awful lot like the Twin Towers. Um, uh, but uh, just a pair of buildings coming down. Uh, all you have to do is uh, start blowing up the building and keep blowing up the building. Because if you stop blowing up a building, the structural integrity will keep it together. Now people say the Twin Towers were uh, just hollow building, and I actually I go back, went back to some 1990s uh, documents, and they actually that's what they actually said. Actually, the construction when it was first built, that's what they said, it was a hollow tube and all that stuff. But in fact, uh, it was a very the, this is the core structure, and it was very dense. The core was was designed to hold uh, two thirds the gravity weight of the building. The uh, outer perimeter column sections that you're seeing here, these uh, I thought they were four tons, but I think I've heard that they're actually 20 tons. Uh, are bolted and welded into place. Uh, they're supposed to only provide the lateral support for, for wind shear, mostly. They have, have some of uh, gravity um, uh, functions, but they're mostly to provide stability. Uh, some of these are going to break the bolts, break the welds, and they're going to be ejected out at uh, up to 70 miles an hour so that they will land um, uh, 600 feet away, 200 meters. Now, um, uh, I think we'll see another picture here. Oh, where are we? Right. Yeah. So um, these are all um, uh, interlaced. It's uh, it made it uh, an extraordinarily strong uh, infrastructure. So to, to destroy it, uh, um, what took an awful lot of energy, far more than you would have gotten from uh, just a gravity-only uh, collapse. The core sections in the middle and the uh, massive, uh, massive uh, uh, beams, uh, uh, support columns. Some of them, as you can see in the top picture there, are six-inch thick. Uh, uh, box columns uh, that are uh, 42 inches long, uh, so they're, it's huge. Uh, these are the floor plates that are put down. Uh, uh, there will be 20, 20 uh, two gauge uh, uh, steel floor plates. They're going to have four to six inches of concrete. And on the left hand side, you can see two bolts go in. Those are the bolts that, in one official story, 
uh, hold, and in the other uh, official story they fail. Uh, so uh, which is the right one? Uh, these four uh, trusses are every five, about every five feet, um, and uh, they're cross braced uh, to provide uh, stability. In the PBS versions uh, of, of what happened to the towers, they don't talk anything about the cross bracings. Now we're going to look at the North Tower demolition waves. Now take a look at the right hand side, and you're going to see this ejections are coming out as fast as stuff is falling in free fall. We'll see, this will, we'll run through this one more time. So you're going to see the ejections of the material uh, going this way. Uh, as fast or faster than the stuff's in free fall. If it, in a gravity only collapse, that cannot happen. Uh, we saw with the French technique that that could happen. See, this is just being just ejected out. And it's only going down through the center line of the building. It's not the whole face of the building that's being destroyed. Um, that's another version of it. You could actually see it r r racing down through the center line there. Um, so, Excuse me. So, um, now we're going to take a look at the South Tower. Um, in the South Tower, uh, in response to the t uh, tip top uh, uh, fall, rotating over 22 degrees, now what you're seeing here is floor by floor by floor by floor uh, 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 ejections of material in all, in, and you can actually see three, three, dimension, three directions. Uh, and it's proceeding such that in two and a half seconds you've gone down about 12 stories. Uh, and the material that's been ejected out is steel, and it's still um, not able to fall fast enough to, uh, to uh, cur provide a curtain to uh, keep you from seeing the... Uh, the next uh, demolition, the next wave, the next floors that are being destroyed. So, so um, the the demolition wave is going as fast or faster than stuff in free fall, uh, and uh, that cannot uh, happen. Um, that cannot happen uh, um, uh, with a gravity only collapse because it has to go a lot slower, as we saw with the French technique. Are you saying that you can see the demolition of the floor before the floors above it compress it? Uh, before material that's been ejected outside the footprint. Let me go, you want, uh, before the material that's been ejected outside the footprint can fall down and, hi, uh, and, and, and uh, hide the next wave of, demo, of uh, material. Right? So things have been ejected out, they're, they're in free fall, and they're going down, and, and by rights they should come down and they should go faster and faster and faster and, and obliterate the, the, next, uh, the next floor because it would take energy to, and time to, to, for the building to go down that far. But in fact, what you see is you see the material being injected out, and it's still hanging out there in midair, accelerating with, uh, 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 as gravity would uh, accelerate it. Uh, and you can then see the next floor going down, being destroyed, the next floor being destroyed, the next floor being destroyed, and this stuff still can't keep up with it. So the, the demolitions are going so fast that uh, down the building, that the stuff that's hanging out in midair can't uh, cover it. Eventually, uh, after it does about uh, 20 stories or so, then it starts to catch up and, and, and go down and, and, and obliterate it. So then you can't see it, and it's just a big cloud of stuff. 95% of the material is outside the footprint of the building. And if it's outside the footprint of the building, how do you, um, how do you uh, uh, what's doing the crushing? Uh, and if you say, well, of course there's stuff in the middle, right? Um, when the North Tower was destroyed, uh, the miracle of Ladder 6 was that there were 13 New York Fire Department uh, 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 mem members and, a, and, a, and someone from the public uh, from the building uh, in the fourth floor stairwell that they hear all the stuff coming down at them, there's all sorts of stuff going on, but ultimately they, when the dust clears, they look up and what do they see? They see the sky. Where's the building? And this is a well-documented thing called the Miracle of Ladder 6. Right? This is what the PBS uh, says happens uh, in one of the most famous or most uh, influential videos uh, that was put out. Uh, it it uh, shows uh, the pancakes uh, going down floor after floor after floor. But what you would see at the bottom is 110 stories of pancakes. And 95% of the mass of the building is outside the footprint um, um, in a 1,200-foot in a diameter debris field. So this is, this is what the PBS version um, uh, uh, claims. But again, uh, the reason this can't be true is you would look down and you'd be able to do an archaeological dig. This is floor 50, below it is 49, 48, 47, but they're all thrown all over uh, a 1,200-foot diameter, diameter debris field. Now, yes, what happened to the top of the South Tower? The top of the South Tower was one of the first. It started to rotate, and it rotated up to 22 degrees. When I first saw it, I, I said, oh my God, we're going to have an 80-story building. 
how did that happen? And then it didn't just fall off the top. It, it disappeared, and the whole building unzipped all the way down. And uh, Now, this is what happens when you have uh, failed control demolitions. Uh, in other words, you stop blowing up the building. Um, and this, these guys uh, didn't get their bonus for the day, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but notice it stayed together as a structural entity. The other one on the right stayed standing, right? Um, this one here dropped about 15 stories. Did it continue go, going down? No. Did it end up destroying, uh, obliterating and throwing everything off to the side? No. Um, buildings have a lot of structural integrity, so if, if the top of the South Tower were to rotate, oh, kind of like this one, um, it would have stayed together as a single entity because they have structural integrity. Now, if you take a look at the aerial view of the North Tower as it's being destroyed, uh, it was from a New York uh, Police Department helicopter, what you see is the damage is in all 360 degrees, right? Um, and the, there's supposed to be a top that's doing the crushing, but it's not even visible. And it should be going slower than everything else because it's crushed doing the crushing. It's not there. Um, uh, NIST uh, will not look for, and uh, 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 that was an FBI letter, actually. Uh, they said that they looked at, at, at a technical article we have. It's down on our table uh, and, and saw no signs of how it could be thermite. Um, this is a, from a, a member of Congress um, uh, who asked NIST. NIST did not uh, collect any samples of the dust, uh, and uh, they're not going to reopen the investigation. They'll look for the stuff he said was there. Um, and so we have a, document, uh, a documentary called 9-11 um, Explosive Evidence. Experts speak out. 43 structural engineers, high-rise architects, chemists, physicists talking about why the official story can't be true. And so with that, I'm going to end this. We'll leave it there. Um, and so um, that's uh, basically what I, what I wanted to do. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Bob McElvain up to, to give a, a, sh a short uh, short talk for his uh, part of the program. Okay, what's, what's short? Well, you know, <laughs> well, we're looking for about uh, 10 minutes or so. 10 minutes? Yeah. You know? So. Oh, you can hear me, can't you? Yes. I'm, I'm an ex-teacher, so. <laughs> uh, in fact, I'm an ex-teacher and I have my... Uh, I obviously, it's not going to be an hour presentation. But just one, piggybacking on World Trade Center 7, uh, and we're talking about you know, fascism. In fact, that's... I have two questions. Two questions. I, I remember the morning of the, the, the collapse of the towers. Question number one, why is it why is it in English as well as in Italian? Pardon me? I'm sorry. Dimulazione controllata is that's for one. one. No, that's an example of another controlled demolition that you yeah, why is it in Italian? Well Italian it's an film. Italian it's an Italian uh, demolition. It's an Italian film. Okay. No, it's an it's Italian the, demolition. Yeah. Uh, we, this was this there there uh, this was a uh, 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 about a forty story steel framed uh, building that was uh, demolished through controlled demolition in, uh, uh, in, Italy. in Italy right and and so there's not a lot not that many there's a lot of uh, controlled demolitions this is the one that was looked the most similar to to that one now the implication of all, all of this is that the twin towers were hit by the planes without question but there was something else involved uh, that's that correct that, that, that's correct and by the way I was I remember that morning and when I heard about it I began to laugh which angered the person who was in the other room. I thought it sounds like it should have, should have been expected. Okay, thank you. Okay. That's my train of thought. <laughs> um, well, talking about fascism, and, you know, I, I can't go through 12 years or 13 years of experience that I had because, you know, the limited time. But, um, I don't know where I was reading it, but going back to, well, in fact, I was on Power, Power Radio the other night, and someone called from, I think, Tennessee, and they, they wanted to try to say, well, do you think the United States is becoming like Nazi Germany? And I said, that's a real big-time loaded question for me. You know, you know I, I taught history in high school or in a private school. Uh, I owned a bar in Philadelphia, Northeast Philadelphia, which is a real union bar. So... And of course, I taught history, but you know, to get into something like that. But I just threw out the quote of I don't know if it's Goebbels or Hitler stating that if you tell a lie enough times, 
will eventually become the truth. Well, real quickly, Osama bin Laden's name has been mentioned since 9-11. Now, I don't know, I've just seen this, but I know at the National Convention, Republican Convention, they've mentioned his name, they must have mentioned it 10,000 times. But his name has been mentioned 52,000 times. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who is supposedly the mastermind, I could spend an hour just talking about Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, supposedly the mastermind of 9-11. 12,000 times. The guy that turned him in, Abu Zubaydah, who dropped a dime on him, said he is the mastermind. They let him go in 2009 because they had, he had nothing to do with Al-Qaeda. So, but the press never reports it. Now, as far as Building 7, I was invited on Harada's show two years ago with Tony Zambodi, part of A&E. And, you know, I thought this was really going to be tough because uh, Fox News, they're really going to grill us. Well, we got there, Harada came out, very nice, very cordial. He said, we can't spend too much time on this, but I want to ask some strong questions. So, he looked at this film. It was on national TV. I don't know if anyone's seen it. So, two years ago, straight around uh, when Osama bin Laden was supposedly killed. And he looked at it, and on air he said, Man, this does look like an in, or a, a controlled demolition. And then he asked me, he said, Bob, do you really think this was an inside job? And I said, no question about it. But Harada, I'm not going to talk about it here because we don't have enough time. And afterwards he said, you know, I'm going to have to invite you back on. And of course, that never happened. So this is on Fox News, but we talk about Osama bin Laden 52,000 times. That's maybe once that we've seen it on TV. Well, you can imagine why people believe what they believe. Osama bin Laden perpetrated 9-11. The FBI in 2002 said they have no, no proof whatsoever Osama bin Laden had anything to do with 9-11. None. Zero. Yet, this whole world believed, well, not everyone, obviously people in the 9-11 movement don't, but uh, so that, it's just, the media is so bad. Oh, so I walked off of the Harada show. Governor Huckabee sitting right there, come out, comes up and shakes my hand and says, Tim, that was a controlled demolition. But we never hear about it. Never. If the press doesn't report it, the people just assume it can't be true. But here you have two, you know, in the belly of the beast, Huckabee and Harada. That sure looks like a controlled demolition. So it's, it's just mind-boggling. And CBS just called me the other day, talking about the... Uh, um, the opening of the uh, memorial. And I said, I really don't want to talk about it. I said, I took my son home. I buried my son the week after 9-11. Believe me, we're one of the lucky ones because, you know, people just turned into molecules after the attack. So I have a gravesite. I go every week. That's my memorial. I'm getting upset. I've been doing this for 12 years. I still can't get through that part. So anyway, I, I said I don't want to talk about that because, you know, out of respect to them, I don't want to say either side of the family or a lot of family members complaining about being buried at the bottom of the museum. And others say it's okay, or they want to bring it up top, so forth and so on. And I said, well, I'd rather talk about just how about Bin Laden? In you know, 2011, he was supposedly hurt or killed. And I said, I'm not a journalist. I'm not an expert. But there's a lot of journalists out there, a lot of newspapers all around the world stating that Bin Laden died in 2001. And, you know, we had talked for like 15 minutes about it. She says, you know, I'm about to quit my job. She says, you're right. She says, the only way we can get information about that is through the State Department or the Pentagon. We're not allowed. We won't be able to report because it'll destroy us. So that's a sad commentary. When the fact when Bin Laden died, uh, Times called me, Star Ledger, Philadelphia Inquirer. I'm from Philadelphia. And the lady in Philadelphia, you know, I gave her that whole story that I just gave to you. And she says, well, I don't know, Bob. I don't know if we're going to pass the editor. 
So she calls me back in about two days. She says, it's unbelievable. I really want to apologize to you. She said, the editor says we can't possibly publish that. Now, that's nothing mind-boggling. I said, you know, this, everyone in the world had heard of this. That's what a journalist says. Let me investigate this. Did he die or didn't he die back in 2001? So it's not controversial. I didn't say anything because it's out there. And uh, she said, the editors have New York Times in touch. Well, all they wanted were nine of eleven family members to say, I hope that no good son of a bitch dies in hell, or uh, lives in hell for eternity. You know, that's the only thing they wanted. So and it's just, the, the press is just mind-boggling. It's just unbelievable. But let me just, Bobby was 26 years old, worked at Bursa Marcel two weeks before 9-11, three weeks before 9-11, he got hired at Merrill Lynch. Came down Fulton Street, got off the subway. I just got a letter from someone from Merrill Lynch that didn't know him. But walked from Fulton Street to the tower. Merrill Lynch is across the street from Tower One. Across the street from West. Okay? So, I have never found anybody that found his body. But the fellow that was behind him that was on the subway at the same time was heading towards Merrill Lynch and he stopped for coffee. He came, just as he came out, a huge explosion coming back from out of the backside. Now, I didn't, after 9 11, I didn't know from squad what happened. We didn't want, you know, we took him home, we buried him. Then we dealt with grief. Uh, I joined this group called, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. September 11th, family for peaceful tomorrows. I'm sorry. But anyway, <coughs> I didn't believe in the war. Immediately. No matter what the stories were. I said it was a crime. So this group of September 11 families, they believe the same thing I did. Uh, a guy named uh, David Petorti and a Colleen Kelly from New York City founded this group. Here we are speaking before the... Uh, the uh, demonstration in New York City before the Iraq War. They gave us the opportunity to speak. We were down in Washington. Uh, I remember just before, I've gone around the world speaking, and, and at this time, I felt so good. We did stone walks in New York City. Uh, we went to Japan from Nagasaki to Hiroshima, or Hiroshima to Nagasaki, or no, vice versa, Nagasaki to Hiroshima. Uh, people in all these towns, they would walk with us. It was 5,000 pounds that we were pushing up there in 100 degree heat. Greatest thing in my life. And to sit with these Buddhists, to, you know, and I, I've become an atheist. And I, you know, and I don't profess it, but I, I just don't believe in God. I don't believe in anything. But to be with those Buddhists was just phenomenal. Most phenomenal people I've ever been around. Uh, so that... These are the things that I did, and I really felt bad about it. I went to Bogota, Colombia, to talk about violence. Big convention down there. And they gave me the opportunity to speak down there. I went to colleges, I went to high schools. Everybody loved it. Here I am a parent whose son was murdered, and I didn't want war. I really didn't want war. I was against it. I used to go to the anti-war movements, Afghanistan. I couldn't understand it. Why are we going into Afghanistan? Well, because of 9-11. I walked out of the 9-11, I, I, I just gave up on them. They felt Afghanistan was all right, but demonstrated against the Iraq war. So I sort of disassociated myself with the peace movement. So they were great years, but nothing was being done. So of course I start going to the 9-11 commission hearings. And it was a joke. I really, really wanted to believe that we were going to get some answers. And I won't go through all the, you know, the, you know, the time there, but when I suddenly made my move to just become an activist for my son was after Condoleezza Rice. I was just so damn angry. <coughs> and I learned that with that anger, the press wanted to hear something. Someone came up to me. I was doing a, a, a show on, uh, from Canada, CBC, is it? And uh, I just, I started cursing. I said, yeah. it's such bullshit. Effing bullshit. I was really that upset. And I've been that angry since. Because the 9-11 commissioners were obsequious to her. She was filibustering. She had a 10-page statement. 
Benvin East says, I just want to know about the PDB, uh, PDB on uh, August 6th. And she just kept filibustering. So they couldn't get, and they only had five minutes each to talk to her. Now here's the National Security Advisor. We want to have information. Everybody wants information. Of course you're not going to get it. So from that day on, I said, that, that's all I'm going to do now is just 9-11 activism. And it was about five, six years ago, I finally got the guts to go up to the, I never viewed the body. Uh, his right arm was missing, but we didn't, he, they would have given us pictures, but they strongly recommended we didn't take the pictures. I didn't view them. Just, they said I could take them if I wanted them. They were just saying the pictures were horrific of his body. So I finally went up to the morgue. I sat down with the uh, fellow examining him. He's probably the only person in 9-11 that actually had an autopsy, and I actually have an outline of all his injuries. And from those injuries, he walked into the North Tower. Now, of course, I don't know where he was. And this is what I talk about mostly now, and I'll try to finish this up. I don't want to get in battles with 9-11 family members. Like, I didn't want to be necessarily down at Ground Zero handing out pamphlets. Because every family member has their own opinions. There are a lot of family members that believe what I believe, but they don't want to get involved. Okay? And it, what it's... What of them believe what you believe? I, I, I wish I knew. At once, what, believe what I do, I, a very, very small percent. Small? Yeah. But I can't, I don't know to tell you the truth, for sure. But, so I know his injuries. He got off at Felton Street, walked to the building. Now, we made many calls to him. His cell phone survived. We made many calls to him, but no answer. Bobby was a good athlete, obviously a smart kid, Princeton graduate, tremendous writer. He wanted to be a writer, but he had to work once he moved to New York. Just can't stand, sit around and write. And he, was, he was hired by Maryland because he was such a terrific writer. They made him vice president of media relations, or assistant vice president. So anyway, he's walking over there. Now this is a story I've pieced together. And to me, there was a huge explosion. The injuries to him were to the face, lost his arm, his entire face was taken off. We identified him by his teeth. But it's important to know that. His chest was full of glass. Okay? He had no burns on him. He had post-mortem burns. But they are, they, she showed me a picture of his legs. They were, it likes he got home from a uh, vacation in Miami. So the whole piece now, this is what I do now. He was killed, he was slaughtered by an explosion. The 9-11 Commission report on page 285 of this book. I'm, I'm not going to go into it, but two lines. Two lines they talk about, they didn't talk about explosions. They said a fireball from the plane hitting came down the elevators. Now, of course, Popular Mechanics talks about this. Fireballs coming down the elevators. There was only one elevator, just one, that could have gotten from the top to the lobby and into the basement. And it's a freight elevator. It's a three-tiered system. So fireballs can't come down. And I won't go into that entire explanation of it because I'm not a scientist. You're going to look at me and say, well, what do I know? But the thing is, I know a fireball isn't that powerful to come down one elevator shaft. And there was a man in that elevator shaft, Arturo Griffith, who survived the whole thing. And when he got down to the basement level, in the basement level one, the doors blow, blew in and broke his leg. Okay, so my whole thing is Bobby had to die by an explosion. The nature of his injuries. He died instantly because he didn't receive, we didn't get a call from him. He would have called us. People up in the towers were calling people after the planes hit. A lot of people were sitting up there talking to their loved ones. 
And so we didn't get a call. So it, it, it took me all this time to figure it out. So I, I'd rather talk about that. So it really presents a problem. I did a travel channel uh, show from Australia, International Travel Channel. They gave me five minutes. They wanted to do it. But they say, who did it? Well, I say, I know, I don't know for sure. I can sit here for the next five hours and we can talk about who did it. You know, the administration, as far as I'm concerned, was deeply involved in this, our government. But I say, I'd rather say that Muslims had nothing to do with my son's murder, period. Because the planes didn't create that havoc. There was havoc. The lobbies destroyed. Those windows, I don't know how many people were in building one, but they're big windows. 206 feet by 206 feet. Windows broken out. B1, B2, B3 level. The path trains were uh, damaged. Big uh, refrigeration units were damaged. Cars were burnt down in the uh, uh, garage. And a fireball did this? It's absolutely, this is what they said. That's their answer. Two simple-minded lines. Fireballs. And not only, they stopped at 77, they stopped at 22nd floor, which the 22nd floor is the uh, command center for the towers. They blew that place up so no one can communicate within the towers. And then people cut in half in the lobby. Fireballs don't do that. So my question to anyone is, well, if the Islamics are flying those planes didn't do it, then who did it? We got a big time problem. My son was not murdered by an Islamic or a Muslim human being. And I'm not contesting who flew those planes. Okay? But the fact is, he wasn't murdered by them. And, you know, I can prove that. And, and then the way the cover-up was, Condoleezza Rice and the 9-11 Commission report. So, that's what I do now. It's a lot simpler. Uh, I don't have the expertise to say about the demolitions, but I've been very involved in it. And then the press is just, they're brutal. They're just absolutely brutal. I, just one more time, it, it, uh, when I was with Peaceful Tomorrow's, we did a, a press conference right before the war also. And I said, what you can't do in this country, we all have these groups, we're all activists. Everybody feels comfortable in their activism. And that's the problem, we get too comfortable in it. But when you go after a president, you are in deep trouble. At the press conference I said, a monkey could have stopped this war. Or it could have stopped 9-11. And I said it again, a monkey could have stopped it. And our president couldn't come close to doing that. Well, next day, two days from now, Rush Limbaugh. He's on the air saying, well, I doubt very much Bob McElveen had his son in there. I just think he's a mouthpiece for the Democratic Party. But that's Kristen Bretweiler. I have her book right here, one of the Jersey girls. When, during the commission, when she was, you know, they were going after Bush. They just wanted to leave Bush, you know, Bush and Cheney would not testify. But they were going after him heavily. Well, so she, she was brutalized. That whole group was brutalized by then the right-wing press. But now the left-wing press is just as bad. You know, I at least got on Harado's show. Before, I was always on shows. You know, Riley had me on, uh, Paul Azan had me on, Amy had me on her show. It was great. But they loved that story. Oh, I'm against the war. Isn't that great? You lost your son, you're against the war. I'm going to march, I'm going to speak out. But then I say something about the United States being involved in this and criticizing Bush, then suddenly you're evil. And I know a lot of people that have a big name. <laughs> if Noam Chauncey came out and spoke about this, he's in danger because he has such a following. There's a good chance he will be eliminated. I've been threatened. A lot of people have been threatened. So it's, I understand, but the thing is, Bobby was, he got me into progressive politics. When he went to Princeton, suddenly, I mean, he's bringing home Z Magazine, Progressive Magazine, all those magazines, and I got heavily involved in it. I loved it. He wrote for the progressive paper of Princeton. And that's tough to be a progressive in Princeton. There's a lot of big time money. You know, we didn't have big time money. You know, we're still paying, well, they, they absolved our loans, but, you know, we're still paying for Jeff, our younger son's loans. So that's, you know, so I, with the progressive politics, I, you know, I just have no politics anymore. That's all I do. 
I'm after, you know, I want the truth. And I, have, I get more satisfaction around the world than I do in the United States. Right. Yes? I understand the 9-11 commission is over because uh, Governor Kane and his politician in Brooklyn the song that they, they said they, were, they weren't given enough money, they, they were given bad information. Well, you're for me, well. The government had no respect for the man, they, 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 they discussed it. In other words, they disowned the man in the commission. It's no longer in existence as far as that goes. Well, they, don't forget, both Keene and Ham or, um, Hamilton. Hamilton and Keene both wrote a book. It was destined to fail. The commissioner said the whole thing was a sham. The Pentagon lied. This is the joint congressional hearing. This, I don't know if you knew about the, the, joint, uh, the first uh, hearings. Uh, Rock, uh, Bob Graham wrote the book. He wrote a book about Saudi Arabia. We can prove beyond a reasonable doubt Saudi Arabia was involved in 9-11. Again, we could talk another two hours about that. But the redacted pages, 28 redacted pages about Saudi Arabia. We met the Jersey Girls and myself. We met with the 9/11 uh, with Hamilton in his office after this book came out. What is the story? Here, look at this. Redacted 28 redacted pages describing Saudi Arabia's involvement with the terrorists. Classified, absolutely classified. Don't we find that just a little suspicious? Well, of course. Well, our brain wrote back. So the commissioners have written about this, but the media won't cover anything. You had the two congressmen that just came out and saw it, and they were going to have to do something about this, but I don't know if anything will come out. So it's, uh, it's just, you know, I've had Russian people come up to me, ground zero, because I did, you know, I've done so many DVDs, you know, videos, and they came up to us and said, you know what's the problem in the United States? Everybody thinks they have a free press. Here in Russia, we know, we know that we're, you know, not being told the truth. But in the United States, you all think you have free press, and that's your problem. And I said, thank you very much, but you're right. And that's, in essence, what the problem in the United States is. You know, who I find blame the press before I blame anyone. Yes? Well, this is more about the left, right, or left forum. So um, could you talk more about your actual interactions, details with leftist media and how the left is not open to this? Are there any insights you could give to that? I mean, I know. What well, it, it, I, I don't. Everything. I don't have any. Kind of, you know, when like I your own personal interactions with like democracy now. Well, democracy. Amy was great. She had me on the show, but I was talking about not going to war. Right. You said that. And then when you changed your mind, did you have any interaction? No. At all? Everything stopped. Once I, you know, once I just decided I'm just going to talk about 9/11 and what I think happened, just keep investigating. You know, and, and you know, Cheney and Bush. You know, it's. Pearl industry. Did you try if, to contact them? No. No. I'm not going to contact them. You know, it's, you know you, it's tough to contact them. You know what I'm going to do? You know, not, I can't contact them. You know, they're not going to do anything. So they contacted you for the yeah. other stuff? Yeah, for the other stuff. And then yeah. they just never contacted you. And again, when I was on the Amy, Amy show, it was great. You know, we talked about war. And again, there's a parent that doesn't want to go to war. And his son was killed by supposedly 19 terrorists. Everyone loved that. Colleges and high schools and everything. Yes. So what was the problem with Amy Goodman? She's supposed to be a free voice, but she's ignored 9/11 almost totally. Do you have any idea? Well, Miss, well, I, you know, I, I don't know if this is true, but I know people tomorrow they sort of ignored me since I dropped out. Uh, funding, 501c3. Peaceful Tomorrow's, and this is why they got in so much trouble, 501c3 is, it's like, again, if you're an activist, it's okay to criticize, we're anti-war, but when you specifically go after, like I did that day to Bush, a monkey could have stopped 9-11, then the heat they took was unbelievable. Mm. Same thing with Amy. You know, Rockefeller Foundation, Carnegie Foundation, I don't know what, but anyway, that's a big time problem. So she has to keep it general. What she's done is great, but she can't have someone on there saying, yes, Bush was involved in 9-11. Well, boom, she's going to lose her, lose her funding in the media. It's like any newspaper. They can't report that I said Bin Laden was killed in 2001. They can't do it. They won't exist anymore. So I, I think that's a big part of it because of the 501c3. And you're going to be ostracized. And that's... Look at some of the people who did speak out about it. You know, um, so 
such as uh, Jesse Ventura and Martin Sheen, or not Martin Sheen, but Charlie Sheen and celebrities. It basically, it's like, you know. Well, I, I know Charlie very well. He, he was going to, we were going to do a show with Empire King out in California. <clears throat> I had quite a few talks with him. And, uh, and, and it was just at that time, I remember Lance talking to him, he was babysitting his son with Bobby. Not named it to my Bob, but his one son was Bob. And uh, he then, that was it. I remember from him since. Then yeah, I just saw YouTube. All of a sudden, these people have shut up, you know. Well, I, you quit, I they get in trouble. I understand Jesse Ventura is living down in Mexico. Hey, yeah, he won't shut up. No, he won't. But, you know. And I, I've had a lot of talks with Jesse Ventura. Yeah. And uh, he's sharp. I like him. But again, it's still difficult for him to go on the show. And, you know, he'll just give you theories, but he would never come out and say on TV, I think Bush was involved in 9-11. Yeah. He won't even say, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, I took too long. Oh, that's great. Good. Here, I'll take you. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, uh, add a comment about the... Uh, 501c3 issue. Um, uh, most 501c3s, uh, it's okay to uh, talk about uh, uh, scientific and educational uh, uh, outreach. Um, and uh, Amy has been contacted numerous, 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 I say it again, numerous times uh, about uh, having Richard Gage on. Now remember, uh, founders of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, or many other of the prominent uh, voices for 9-11 Truth. Um, and in fact, uh, has never gotten uh, any response. Uh, NP, our favorite, our favorite uh, uh, of the kind of the middle left, I would say, uh, NPR, all things considered, they'll never touch it. Terry Gross, never touch it. They've been given DVDs, they've been talked to um, when they, opportunities have arisen. Uh, and these are not uh, talking about political <laughs> figures or, or anything that's related that's in violation of a 501c3 status. Uh, this, is all in, uh, this is all in violation of the code of silence. Um, so they won't touch, they won't touch it. They won't even, they, they can no longer ridicule uh, uh, the controlled demolition um, paradigm uh, without getting a huge amount of pushback, uh, losing a lot of credibility. Uh, so the only th option they have left to them is silence. And uh, silence is what we've what we've had. Um, and uh, even when you see, we'll have run a video, of, uh, short little video with uh, Noam talking about 9/11 uh, in response to a direct question at the University of Florida. Um, but um, what I'd like to do is, uh, uh, hang on a sec. Uh, yes. Let me just make a uh, comment concerning the movement. I had a letter with a um, party, and I asked them why should they be doing 9/11. And she said, uh, "Put me in the face and says because I want to live." It's unclear. There you go. Wow. There you go. Hold on, hold on. It's unclear because when you lose the show, the show is killed. It's unclear if she's referring to her life or the life of her show. But that was the end of it. She didn't even want to talk about what that meant at that point. So again, this is anecdotal. This is not proven the case or anything, but it's interesting. All right. Well, um, two horrendous things. Yes. Yes, sir. I have a question. Is it just no. part of you? Are you saying? <laughs> That the 9-11 the both towers was an inside job. If that's the case, I just want to explain also that the, the corresponding fact that both the towers are hit by two planes. Oh, I'm, first of all, uh, thank you, thank you for asking the question. Um, uh, but let's roll back to um, what happened on 9-11. Um, actually, let's let's roll back to just last last September 11th. What did we see on the news? Oh, today's the anniversary. You'd see the planes hitting and you'd see the buildings coming down. The planes hit, the buildings came down. That's what most people, I run into this all the time. They see that the, the planes uh, were uh, hit the buildings and they fall down. Let's roll back to the real 9-11 and what you find out is that, uh, what you notice is that the planes hit. The buildings swayed according to people in there and came back. Both towers, the buildings swayed as they took, uh, absorbed the impact and the energy, and they came back to, to center, as they were designed to do, because not so much about taking a hit, but for wind resistance. If there's a lot of wind, they'd get blown, pushed over to one side, and then come back. So the buildings took the hit, and they stood standing, burning. Class 1 buildings, 
fire, uh, fireproof steel concrete buildings. The fire moved from where it was, uh, from where it uh, uh, was initiated. Within the first 10 minutes, all the fuel was burned up. Uh, that's not just what we say. That's what the NIST report says. The NIST report says that the, the, the fuel added no significant heat to the building. Uh, so what was burning is fire-resistant carpeting, fire-resistant tables, fire-resistant chairs, papers and file cabinets. That's what was burning like any other normal office fire. All right. So after these buildings have been standing with no visible sign of, of deformation, no creaking, no crumpling, no nothing, the South Tower instantly begins to come on down. And we saw what happened. It instantly begins. There's nothing that says, hmm, oozing, creaking, tumbling, cracking. And the North Tower does the same thing about 15 minutes later. Instantly it comes, starts coming down. Demolition waves running down through the center line as fast as uh, stuff is in free fall. So the planes hit, but there's an hour or an hour and a half before instantly they start to come down. That implies that the buildings were already exactly well before. Exactly. exactly. By whom and what for? Well, the what uh, the group that I volunteer for, architects and engineers for 9/11 and Truth, doesn't get into the who does it or why. Just that it is big enough to know that the, this news is out there that the buildings were in fact destroyed, uh, and in, um, and in, uh, by means of controlled demolition, and that we need a new investigation. That's if they hadn't hit that morning, we would have occurred. Uh, if the planes did hit, there would have been no cover for the, their demolition. So, uh, and it took me, you know, I, um, my journey starts five years, five or six years ago, because uh, people have been whispering in my ear that something was wrong. I saw a, a documentary by Richard Gage. I wanted to say, oh, an architect is going to tell me how the buildings were built, because I can't understand how they came apart. Uh, uh, so I went and saw it, and, I, and, I, and it was all about not how they were built, but in fact, how they came apart. And, and the things that he pointed out were just uh, irrefutable. And it took me another year and a half of looking at all the evidence, getting on the blogs, dealing with people who said, I can't believe it, blah, 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 blah. But everything that they would say, you actually look at it really deep, and they say, no, it tells you the opposite. You look, you look over here and you see something completely different. Um, and that the only explanation is controlled demolition of these towers. Now, there's a gentleman over here. And the explosions. I'm watching in slow motion. You can see the explosions yeah, yeah. going down. So I'm like, wow. Yeah. It was explode. It was slow motion. You see the explosions. Yeah. yeah. The video captures that no really well. No way a plane can do that. No in, way. In all 360 degrees. Yes, sir. After they had to analyze the the dust from the Brooklyn Bridge to the West End, from the Battery to 14th Street. And they had five, six, eight samples of the dust with the thermite on windowsills in buildings on Worth Street and around the corner on Hudson. Why at that point didn't the architectural and structural engineering communities say they know, based upon their education and experience, that this was controlled, the thermite is there, and they didn't move as a professional group against the whole mine. Well, um, there's there's a whole lot of uh, issues uh, associated with that. First of all, uh, thank you for bringing up the the, uh, the 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 paper. We have a copy of it at our at our table. Um, uh, the paper identifying the nanothermite. I talk about that in if I, when I want to get to the physics part of it uh, of it. It's um, really really good. Um, it, um, but why doesn't the engineering community uh, support this? Because they don't know about it. Uh, in fact, uh, Architects and Engineers has been trying to get uh, people to sign the petition for six years. We now have 2,200 architects and engineers. We've uh, got, a do got documentaries out there that explain how this all works. Um, um, we can no longer, we, we, we now publicly say um, we cannot find a licensed architect, licensed engineer to support the NIST investigation in a debate with us. We can't find anyone. So when you hear Noam say, ah, oh, minuscule number of architects and engineers, the ones that will, um, the, the ones that are credentialed, and who have some skin in the game, are such a minute, such a minuscule, 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 minuscule part that there isn't one of them out there that will support them. Right. So the ASCE, the, the American Society of uh, Civil Engineers, um, uh, when asked about this, uh, says they support the their the uh, NIST report. 
And that's all they'll say. Look, I'm a, a, a financial guy yeah. professionally. I knew in two, 2008 that this was a systemic fraud, okay, that, that would occur. I would think from a professional standpoint on the architectural and structural engineering community that they know what's possible and what's not, <coughs> coupled with the nanothermite samples, that they wouldn't take a united stand. It just doesn't make any sense to me that you only have 2,600 people. When on the financial side, and that fraud, and I consider this a fraud as well, you could put all those pieces together, and now we have redundancy within the system on, on the systemic fraud on the financial side. There had to be a lot of redundancy in terms of the proof on, on, on this event as well. Let me ask you a quick one here. One of the people on Experts Speak Out, who is a structural engineer, a young man who worked for himself, after the film came out, he decided he was going to shut down his business and try to get a job with a bigger firm. He asked us to take him off the list because he knew that it was going to be hard for him to find a job. Now, we couldn't because he was even on as Experts Speak Out, but I that's the reason. That, but at, today, there's 10,000 people a day passing 60. A good percentage of those are engineers and architects who, because they're out of the game and they can't be hammered, would tell the truth. You'd like to think so. What about their social security? So, so <laughs> they can't take their social So, so let me, let me, okay, let me just, let me just add one more vignette, then, then I want to move over, over to Dave. Um, I just finished um, uh, an extraordinary uh, week. Uh, I went to Chicago to the Institute of Electrical, Electrical and Electronic Engineers uh, Convention in Chicago. Uh, 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 they had a 2014 symposium on ethics and science, engineering, and technology. Uh, and uh, we presented a poster paper. Uh, it was the ethics track uh, was about uh, the need for peer review and and use the NIST reports related to the Twin Towers uh, as the basis for it. Almost nobody there was aware of, of, of the controlled demolition aspects of it. They weren't aware. It's not that, like that they were, oh, I don't want to talk. They weren't aware. I went, then went to the Virginia Tech uh, to the forum on the philosophy of engineering and technology, because they also had an ethics track. And I did a case study of the need for peer review uh, studies, um, um, uh, focused on Building 7 and all the things that have been found out about through Freedom of Information Acts about uh, what's missing. Um, I gave a talk to about a room of about 15. Two, because I'd been talking about it for two two days, were pretty kind of much on board. Everyone else was had never heard of it before. They thought I was they thought I was nuts. They were trying to find out something wrong with what I was saying, but they couldn't see it, and they but they never heard of it. But what so you're saying the is silence the Holocaust is, deniers equivalent, you know, on this subject. Well, it, they're not Holocaust deniers. They're, they have no basis for even knowing about anything except the official stuff. Okay. Even as professionals, they even don't care. They don't, they don't know. They haven't heard. That's the tough I'll, thing for me to accept. Well, yeah. I think it's important to understand that access to the evidence is very, very limited. Yes, but you can reproduce it on a computer with CAD CAM. Yeah, but you're saying, why was it immediately understood? The fact of the matter is, that nobody felt given the horrible trauma to really look at that immediate time. While the conspirators had arranged to get all the structural elements yep. that had been cut into sections that could be put on trucks 400 a day, yep. ready to yep. ship to uh, China. China. So China. there was such a cover up that it stunned everybody. They were breathing what they thought was a legitimate uh, loss. Okay. And the idea that it was a government conspiracy only emerged when the evidence was gradually accumulating. Thermite came into the picture late, and then they found it in the debris. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, these emails. The top one is my email if you want to help on any of the things I raise. The, top, the second one is Les Jameson, who's a New Yorker, who helps organize uh, the leafleting at the museum that we do. You want to help with leafleting at the museum? We will need. We need that. So my first question is, how many people here know who Barry Jennings is? Ooh, most don't. Well, I'm glad you came. 
<laughs> we'll talk more about him in 15 minutes. Important New Yorker, great hero. Um, I'm dedicating my remarks today to someone who played a large part in radicalizing me as an undergraduate at MIT in the late 60s and early 70s. That person is Mike Albert, the editor of Z Magazine. He was expelled from MIT while he was president of the student body. Very exciting guy. Um, I'm dedicating this talk to him because he won't even talk to me about the issues I raised today. And by dedicating this talk to him, I also get to know that I saw a picture uh, recently of Karl Marx in his youth, spitting image of Mike Albert in his youth. <laughs> <coughs> Mike's more of an anarchist, though. Uh, I'm here today to cause trouble and shake things up a little so the left re-examines its comfort level about 9-11. My basic complaint is that neither the left or the truth movement are effective enough at being anti-fascists. And being anti-fascist is important. Fascism is the unity. Slow. Okay. Fascism is the unity of um, economics and politics, along with a mystical leader. Uh, but what is foremost on my mind is civil liberties, which disappears under fascism. Too many active uh, leftists act like they'd rather be deprived of freedom of speech and association before they agree the government's story about 9-11 is a lie. After seeing what we've just seen, who here does not believe the official version of 9-11 that 19 Muslim fanatics hijacked four planes and flew them into the Twin Towers, the Pentagon, while the fourth was overpowered by passengers and crashed in a field so powerfully there were no debris visible? <laughs> okay. I believe that. Yeah. All right. How many have changed their perspective as a result of what you have seen earlier in this session? So you were all with us before. Um, who here believes there is a ruling class based on an ownership of the means of production? Okay, yeah, surprising. A lot of leftists here. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask that. First, I'm going to praise both the truthers and the leftists in this audience, and then I'll let the other shoe drop as we discuss the limitations imposed by thinking, wishing actually, whistling in the dark that things are not so bad yet. Uh, here's my praise for the truthers. I am the founder of DC 9-11 Truth in, in 2006. I pissed them off pretty quickly. Uh, I objected to their infatuation with former LaRouche Webster Tarpley. They got over it and we are now on good terms now. Uh, the first thing I said at the first event DC 9-11 Truth ever did was, if I live to be 100 and I'm still an activist, nothing Nothing will piss them off more than this issue. The point, folks, is that the truth movement must be considered worthy because it creates such huge opposition from those in power. Now, here's my praise for the left. Two stories from the anti-nuclear power movement. Once at a meeting in preparation for a mass action at Seabrook, I was at odds with the most respected person in the leadership called Steve. And we each weighed in on the matter, and the person we didn't know spoke in support of Steve's position. The fellow had some facts wrong, but Steve corrected him, not wanting try to triumph in our disagreement if he had to support a misunderstanding. Mainstream politicos do not live that way. <clears throat> Another example. One time, a leading anti-nuclear activist was criticized by a local group for a mistake that resulted in a large financial liability. Those doing the criticizing did not accuse that person of lying or stealing. We all know mainstream politicians lie and steal regularly, with few exceptions. The point about the, both these stories is that while most leftists have integrity, mainstream politicians use blame, deflect criticism, and are willing to let false stories circulate if it is in their immediate interest. Please note that I have been very active in the 9-11 Truth Movement since 2002. Many truthers are dedicated and have done a lot of research. They're pretty knowledgeable and frequently self-taught. There's a lot of good information available to those that look. However, there is much misinformation that is out there also. Some of it is quite compelling. If you don't ask questions, they bring you back to the laws of physics. Now, I'm going to let the other shoe drop on both groups. <clears throat> There are also people with degrees listed after their names who promote some of this misinformation. Some truthers adopt these fanciful theories and could care less whether they can prove what they assert. 
whatever the wildest, most outrageous theory they can consider is where some of them stand. Wild theories are fun. It just doesn't help us agree, uh, achieve a just society, but they are fun. The goal of many truthers I've encountered is to live long enough so that they will be able to tell all the people who diss them, I told you so. <laughs> they don't care about using the available evidence of a false flag operation on 9-11 to prevent or counter the ramping up of fascism. They just like to sit in their basement commiserating through the internet with other truthers who are also sitting in their basement. <clears throat> doing research, uh, doing outreach has been made painful by the messages transmitted to every American by their media and politicians. This is what Goebel said when uh, it's easier to sell a big lie than lots of little ones. Now, most truthers hate being activists, partly because they have been ridiculed once too often, partly because they're just too paranoid. Uh, there was an attempt at a rally in D.C. last anniversary where they called for a million people. Guess the turnout? Two dozen. By the way, truther is an unfortunate term. Even Noam Chomsky does not use the word truther. The problem with the term truther is that it implies that such people can't have a civil conversation with people with whom they disagree. Funny thing about that. Now, most truthers prefer research to activism. They think that they alone can get to the bottom of what happened that day without the assistance of subpoena power. And getting subpoena power is going to take a lot more than isolated individuals in their basements. There are a tiny minority of truthers who are willing to be activists. However, many of them prefer to work in isolation. I assume the reason for being unwilling to work with other people is that they will have to listen to people say things they don't agree with. <clears throat> or they will have to agree to a common outreach strategy. Uh, if you're good at listening to people you generally agree with, you can actually get better at achieving your goals. If you dislike other people who largely agree with you so much that you refuse to work with them, then the common goals must not be important enough. As we are discussing here, being anti-fascist is not viewed to be important enough. This brings us to the organizations of the truth movement. The local 9-11 victim family members deserve support in their efforts to have a ballot petition on this year, and they're instrumental in, uh, and I have flyers here if you want to help, uh, uh, they're instrumental in supporting the high-rise safety campaign. The judges and politicians will show their colors by shutting down this initiative, but it is quite a good idea to let the power brokers expose their fears. Maybe New York City could even eventually have a truther mayor. Let's set a goal of having a truth-friendly mayor in 10 years. The only national truth organization which has attempted grassroots organizing is Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. They are very concerned that they can prove what they assert, in contrast to most of the rest of the movement. I worked with them for seven years and founded a couple of dozen national teams at varying levels of functioning. Sadly, they are now completely controlled by bureaucrats. All leftists know what that means. I have recruited dozens of volunteers over the years who have quit because they were unwilling to wait months to get approved lists of petition signers to reach out to. <coughs> The board now acts like all non-professionals are useless. No left group would allow such counter-revolutionary foolishness. I must add, there are no police agents on the board. They are all, except Wayne, just misguided. It is not obvious to the leadership. Agent? What? I'm a police agent? Is that what you're, they're all, none of them are police agents. Yeah, yeah. They're all just misguided, except you. You're not even misguided. <laughs> I actually used to say at meetings that as far as I'm concerned, Wayne can do no wrong. Uh, <clears throat> it is not obvious to the leadership of AE 911 Truth that they need to counterbalance the hostility to organizing by the grassroots. Truthers, by developing organizational structures which support volunteers. The truth movement needs the common sense 
uh, lessons of the left. Leftists could be could set a good example for the truth movement. Instead of opposing the truth movement, the left should support 9-11 truth goals and oppose counterproductive approaches like paranoia and anti-volunteer attitudes. The left has been infiltrated forever, but it handles such problems much better than the truth movement. So I'm going to do something for AE 9-11 truth right now. How many people here drink coffee regularly? Okay. AE 9-11 Truth makes $2 per pound of coffee sold by its private label coffee seller listed at the AE 9-11 Truth online store. Um, please just try one of the featured coffees. <coughs> you will get what is reported to be some of the best coffee around. Two of the featured coffees are e ideally named for 9-11 Truth, Fog Lifter and Jet Fuel. <laughs> now to excoriate the left. Nearly every left magazine, show, blog, and news aggregator is publicly hostile to 9-11 truth. We don't know their personal perspectives, but it is their public persona that we will address here. The Nation, Mother Jones, The Progressive, In These Times, Z Magazine, Dissent, Counterpunch, American Prospect, Democracy Now!, Huffington Post, Common Dreams, Truth Out, Reader Supported News, The Daily Coast, Washington Monthly, Rachel Maddow, Ed Schultz, Center for American Progress, Talking Points Memo, Salon, Move On, Crooks and Liars, Fire Dog Lake, Media Matters for America are all hostile to discussion of the best evidence. <clears throat> the evidence proves the government is lying about 9-11. They'll discuss straw man arguments, but not our best evidence. Our biggest problem is the most respected leftist in the world, Noam Chomsky. I can't tell you how many people have told me they refuse to even look at evidence about 9-11 because of Chomsky. I recently noted to one friend that Chomsky was our biggest problem. And they noted that Chomsky was a lot of people's biggest problem. One time a few decades ago, Noam was pleased to see that in one week, three different national foreign ministers took the trouble to publicly criticize him. When I was an undergraduate, back when Moses was a pup, I took several political courses from Noam. Chomsky said many, many times, don't accept what I say, look into it yourself. Anybody heard him say that late, recently? That's too bad. I do have an amusing Chomsky story directed at all the truthers who have no respect for Noam. It shows him as being quite a mensch. <coughs> Everybody in New York City knows what a mensch is, right? Okay. <coughs> um, in 2007, I brought Richard Gage, the founder of AE 9-11 Truth, to speak at MIT. He told me that the night before, um, he had called director assistance to get Noam's home phone. It was 1.30 a.m. But you did not realize directory assistance automatically connects you to the number. <laughs> Noam answers as if it's 1.30 p.m. rather than a.m. Richard introduces himself and invites Noam to the talk the next night. Noam politely declines. Of course, he once later notes that he has spoken with Richard. Uh, by the way, please don't call Noam at 1.30 in the morning. Um, <clears throat> here's my primary criticism of Noam. Uh, my favorite of his quotes comes from his first political book, American Power and the New Mandarins. What a great name. Uh, it reads, the responsibility of intellectuals is to speak the truth and expose lies. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have here one of Professor David Ray Griffin's 10 books on 9-11. It's called 9-11 Contradictions. It delineates 25 different situations where the government contradicts itself, or government and the corporate medium and can <clears throat> contradict each other. That implies at least 25 different lies. That includes three different versions uh, from the military of, for a timeline that day. What planet are we on when Noam Chomsky or Amy Goodman, for that matter, are running interference for the United States Defense Department? When people stop and look at the physics of 9-11, of what happened in the Twin Towers, and they see that Noam Chomsky can't see the evidence of controlled demolition of those massive buildings, they ask, is Gnome living on Neptune? So we're going to show them the video clip now. Yeah. Can you uh, darken the lights there? So this is the uh, at the University of Florida, and uh, uh, just last October, fresh.
thanks for coming. Uh, you mentioned quite a few contradictions from the media and, and their presentation on things. And I think the most uh, notorious case of this is with September 11th, 2001. You mentioned in a forum on Znet in 2006 that you wanted to see a consensus of engineers and specialists that understand the actual structures of these buildings and their possible collapse. Uh, and there is such a group, and I'm here to tell you about that and ask you a follow-up question. It's called Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. There's a consensus of over 2,000 of them. Right, is this a question? Or Please don't interrupt. I'm asking a question. I'm setting it up. Thank you. This consensus shows that Building 7, the third building that fell on 9-11, fell in free fall speed, as this report acknowledges. Are you ready to come forward and jump on board with 9-11? I know you've mentioned it's a distraction, but there's no better case of the media covering up things than not presenting Building 7, that third building. We've all seen the other towers fall, but what about Building 7, no? Well, in fact, uh, you're right that there's a consensus among a minuscule number of architects and engineers, tiny number, a couple of them are perfectly serious, they are not doing what scientists and engineers do when they think they've discovered something. What you do, when you think you've discovered something, what you do is write articles in scientific journals, uh, give talks at the professional societies, uh, go to the civil engineering department at MIT or Florida or wherever you are, and present your results, uh, and uh, then proceed to try to convince the National Academies, the Professional Society of Physicists and Civil Engineers, the departments of the major universities, convince them that you've discovered something. Now there happen to be a lot of people around who spent an hour on the internet and think they know a lot of physics, but it doesn't work like that. There's a reason why there are... I mean, there, there's a reason... There's a, may I finish? There's a reason why there are graduate schools in these departments and, and research. So the thing to do is pretty straightforward. Do what scientists and engineers do who think they've made a discovery. Now, when this is brought up, as it has been, uh, there are one or two minor articles. Like this one article that appeared in an online journal which claims to have found where someone claims to have found traces of nanothermite in Building 7. Uh, I don't know what that means. You don't know what that means. Uh, but if it means anything, bring it to the attention of the scientific community. That's a couple of other fragments like that. So yes, there are, there's a small group of people who believe this, and there's a straightforward way to proceed. Now when this is brought up, there's a standard reaction. Scientists and engineers and professional societies and physicists are so intimidated by the government that they're afraid to take, to, they don't have the courage to take this position. Anyone who has any part, record of part, any familiarity with political activism knows that this is one of the safest things you can do. It's almost riskless. Uh, people take risks far beyond this constantly, including scientists and engineers. I could have run through and can run through many examples. I mean, this is kind of a, maybe people will laugh at you, but that's about it. It's an almost riskless position. So that can't be the reason why nobody's convinced. However, there's a much more deeper issue, which has been brought up repeatedly, and I have yet to hear a response to it. There happens to be, whatever one thinks about Building 7, frankly, I have no opinion. I, I don't know as much uh, science and engineering as the people who believe that they have an answer to this. Uh, so I, I'm willing to let the professional societies uh, determine it if they get the information. So whatever the facts, there's just overwhelming evidence that the Bush administration wasn't involved. Very elementary oh, evidence. You don't have to be a physicist to understand it. You just have to think for a minute. Okay. So let's think for a minute. The, uh, there's a couple of facts which are uncontroversial, right? 
One fact that is uncontroversial is that the Bush administration desperately wanted to invade Iraq. That's a long-standing goal. There's good reasons for it. You know, second largest energy resources in the world, right in the middle of the world's major uh, energy producing region, you know, perfectly obvious reasons, which they in fact later stated, but they were obvious anyway. So they wanted to invade Iraq, one uncontroversial fact. Second uncontroversial fact, they didn't blame the 9-11 uh, on Iraqis, they blamed it on Saudis, mainly. That's their major ally. So they blamed it on people from their major ally, not on the country that they wanted to invade. A third uncontroversial fact, unless they're total lunatics, they would have blamed it on Iraqis if they were involved in any way. That would have given them an open season on invading Iraq. The total support, international support, the UN resolution, uh, no need to concoct uh, wild stories about uh, the weapons of mass destruction and uh, contacts between Saddam and Al-Qaeda, which of course quickly exploded, discrediting them. Uh, no reason to invade Afghanistan, which was mostly a waste of time for them. But they didn't. Well, the conclusion is pretty straightforward. Either they are total lunatics or they weren't involved. And they're not total lunatics. So whatever you think about Building 7, there are other considerations to be concerned with. <laughs> All right, I think our speaker um, answered that question succinctly, so that's the only question we'll have on that topic. Um, So um, I'm going to go a little off script here, and I'm going to uh, uh, go through, touch on the peer review aspect of it uh, that uh, uh, Noam says uh, should be incontroversial. Uh, I'm going to skip, this is a part of the paper I presented just uh, on uh, Thursday at the uh, Forum on the Philosophy of Engi um, um, uh, Engineering and Technology. And I'm just going to skip through uh, a number of things. Uh, first of all, uh, Scott Knowles uh, did a really great paper called Lessons in the Rubble, the World Trade Center and the History of Disaster Investigation in the United States. He says that conf conflicts over authority, expertise, memory, and finally the attribution of responsibility suffuse the history of disaster in the United States. History shows that with time, a community of engineers and scientists has generally proven able to explain the technical particulars of a structural collapse. The disaster investigation, far from proving itself the dispassionate scientific verdict on causality and blame, actually emerges as a hard-fought contest to define the moment in politics and society, technology, and in culture. Um, so um, I'm just going to touch on the next two slides, three slides, about uh, the history of peer review. Because Noam says, get it, peer review. We've tried to do that. It's not worked out quite so well because it's hard to get things through the professional <coughs> gatekeepers, too. So Kathleen Fitzpatrick's chapter, The History of Peer Review, in her book, describes the uh, uh, origin of, uh, of the process. Today, authors tend to date the advent of the editorial peer review defined as the assessment of manuscripts by more than one qualified reader, usually not including the editor um, of a journal or, or a press, to the 1752 Royal Society of London's creation of the Committee on Papers to oversee the review and selection of texts for publication in its nearly year old, uh, century old journal, Philo uh, Philosophica, Philosophical Transactions. Peer review has its deep origins in state censorship as developed through the establishment and membership practices of state supported academies. Peer review was intended to augment the authority of the journal's editor, was um, um, uh, rather uh, than to ensure the quality of a journal's products. Our contemporary notions about the purpose of peer review that we now value in the academy seems not to have become a universal part of the scientific method and thus the scholarly publishing process until as late as the middle <coughs> of the 20th century. Mario Biagioli, uh, in his book from uh, Book Censorship to Academic Peer Review, says, the establishment of editorial peer review was tied to the royal license that was required for the legal sale of printed text. This mode of state censorship in, was employed to prevent sedition or heresy and was delegated to the royal academies through the imprimatur granted at the time of their founding. 
the Royal Society of London passed a resolution in December 1663 that such books contained nothing but was suitable to the design and work of, of, of the society. The purpose is more related to censorship and uh, self-control, uh, or uh, censorship uh, than, than to quality control. Um, and the paper that I go uh, describe here goes into the, a number of other things, but it, uh, it is uh, uh, not true that uh, the role of censorship um, uh, is gone. It is still there in, in the peer review process. And with that, I'm going to turn it over, back over to Dave. Lights. I'd like to make a comment about that because um, I've been involved in We've experienced that. Um, I, my name is Christina Borgeson. I spent 17 years uh, on uh, investigating TWA Flight 800. I was a, a network producer and lost my job twice trying to report on it. And I finally, last year, with six whistleblowers from the original investigation, um, who were you know TWA's top investigator, National Transportation Safety Board's top investigator, et cetera, people who handled the evidence and had the uh, expertise to assess it, came forward. And during this process, you know, we, and we just look at the evidence, the hard evidence, and assess it in our, in our show. And um, during that process, we reached out all over the world to scientists, particularly explosives experts, metallurgists and people who were experts at um, uh, on the um, earmarks of uh, explosions, uh, ordnance explosions on aluminum. And we ran into the problem of people saying the minute they knew what it was for, and so with you it must be, it would be even you know, ten times worse, I'm sure, but the minute you say it's T the TWA 800 crash, those people withdraw faster than you can, you know, snap your fingers. And one German, one German guy said to, said to us, he goes, look, you know, we deal with defense contracts, we can't do it. And a lot of the people that we tried to reach out to, particularly the metallurgists and the explosives experts, dealt in the United States dealt with the Pentagon and had Pentagon contracts. And the other people just did not want to be associated because it, with, with the, such a controversial subject. Because if indeed they, their review of the evidence runs in your favor, they become whistleblowers too. And they don't want to be in that position. So he has, he has no concept of this part I mean, it's it's a form of you know fear. I call, I also think it's a cor corruption. But you know, the scientific community is like any other community. You know, the people want to keep their jobs. You know, they want they don't want to be blackballed. They don't you know. And so he's uh, Chomsky is is absolutely wrong. Thanks so much because I don't deal with that well enough. I appreciate you saying that. Um, no one pleads ignorance of advanced hard science. He suggests we appeal to MIT's civil engineering department. Unfortunately, the lead investigator for the federal engineering study on how the towers came down got his PhD from that MIT department. We had a retired engineering professor who was nationally respected in forensics become active with the AE 9 truth, but decided to withdraw because he did not have the heart to publicly oppose his friend, the lead author of the NIST reports, now, I'm very glad that Chum Sunder, that MIT PhD, is such a nice guy that his friends can be unwilling to criticize him. <coughs> From what I heard, they say Himmler was a kind to his family. My argument to Noam and the rest of you folks who don't feel comfortable with hard science is that this is ninth grade science. A former teacher of ninth grade science told me this very simple argument. The top of a building cannot crush the bottom of a building without slowing down. It's that simple. The cold concrete and steel in the floors right below where the planes hit should have provided at least some resistance. The fact that it did not slow the destruction of the Twin Towers implies explosives or incendiaries were used and the official story is a lie. We don't need one more piece of evidence. <clears throat> <clears throat>
let me relate a story from my 90,000 miles hitchhiking in my youth. I used to get off at rest areas and walk up to people asking for a ride so I could hitch through the night. I was in Maryland trying to get to Boston. A fella said he could give me a lift. I said, great, where are you going? He said, Miami. I said, but I'm going to Boston. He said, well, I'm going there after Miami. And I said, well, the, I, I, I don't think we'll make it on time. He said, not if my truck's running good. Now, I mean, he's a very nice fellow, but he couldn't do fifth grade arithmetic. That's closer to the ninth grade science than any of us who graduated college, much less Noam's great intellectual achievements. As regards Chomsky's assertion there are no peer-reviewed papers on our assertions, my friend Tim Eastman, a PhD in physics, has prepared a peer-reviewed paper that was already out at the time that happened when Noam said those things, uh, that you can find on the Journal of 9-11 Studies, came out last spring. <clears throat> uh, in the paper, he, he reviews 80 three, not a couple, 83 peer-reviewed papers which take a stand on how World Trade Center 1 or 2 or 7 or combinations came down. The majority support controlled demolition. Of the 15 that address World Trade Center 7, only one of the 15 does not support controlled demolition. And that's a paper by the people at NIST. And by the way, by the way no, the Bush cabal blamed Iraq not Saudi. I must assume the Bushies realized there was enough openness to Islamophobia in the U.S. that many Americans wouldn't care to distinguish between Iraq and Saudi. <laughs> For a more detailed critique of Noam by my friend and whistleblower chemist Kevin Ryan, who lost his job at Underwriter Labs for his efforts on behalf of 9-11, <coughs> check out his blog, digwithin.net. Which brings me to the title of this talk where I get to show that left gatekeepers are facilitators of Islamophobia. We all know that all progressives, whether liberals or radicals, are anti-racist. I mean, some white people are better at being anti-racist than others, but there's no disagreement as to what is right and just. <clears throat> this is the perfect criticism of so-called left gatekeepers because it is not reasonable to insist they be left truth supporters. It is reasonable to insist they discuss the truth movement's best evidence. To the degree they weaken support for the official story is the degree they make life better for Arab and Muslim people here and around the world. To avoid such a discussion, I've had respected progressives act like I had just asserted 9-11 truth could fully eradicate Islamophobia, which I did not say. Fascism will be in serious trouble when Amy Goodman has Richard Gage as her guest. <laughs> Another important aspect of 9-11 should interest all progressives was also <clears throat> related to race. History will see the great hero of 9-11 was an African-American New York City employee named Barry Jennings. <clears throat> you can see the website I set up, JenningsMystery.com. Jennings died mysteriously on August 19th. 2008, two days before the final draft of the NIST report on World Trade Center 7. A, interestingly, a private detective uh, who had been paid money paid, gave the money back when asked to look into the matter. Jennings is important because his testimony proves there were explosions of World Trade Center 7 too early to be a, as a result of the fall of the North Tower. Barry Stoy should be significant to media critics like Noam Chomsky and Bob Perry, since it is a great example of the irresponsibility of the corporate press. The old gray lady did not mention this hero's passing. This hero's passing. There should be a whole workshop every year at the Left Forum on Barry Jennings, New York City's own Barry Jennings. He spoke of Allah and video footage. We don't even know what mosque he belonged to. Anybody here want to help look into this issue? Who was he? He was, he was in the third tower that day and escaped with his life. Yeah, he and he was on video tape. Video. And he, uh, he, he said he heard explosions. And it was too early for those explosions to have been as a result of debris falling from the North Tower. So he saw explosions. You want to help? He died. He just died like. Crazy. And we no, don't know how he died. No evidence or nothing. Bro. So. There's ways. 
Yeah. <laughs> so uh, who, who was saying they can help? I do need help on this. That was Henry. Okay, great. I'll be in touch. Um, <clears throat> now, who here has ever heard of the term socialist realism? Ah, we are in the left conference. Uh, socialist realism was embraced by the old left, uh, but not well thought of by the so-called new left. When we uh, got to the eighth floor, I thought... I'll play, it, I'll play a clip of Benning, Barry Jennings. Okay. Oh. Uh, do you want me to do it now? Want to do it now? Or? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. Can we do that? When we got to the eighth floor, I started walking to one side of the building. That side of the building was gone. The first explosion I heard when I was on the stairwell landing, when we made it down to the sixth floor. Then we made it back to the eighth floor. I heard some more explosions. You know, so the sound. Like a boom. Like, a, like an explosion. More than one? Yes. We started walking down the stairs. We made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. We was back into the eighth floor. When we get outside, the police officer comes to me and says, you have to run. We have more information of bombs, so you have to run. When we got to the eighth floor... So, so that's the... Uh, so, no juice. Yeah. No. So, so that um, shows the, um, uh, uh, the history of Barry Jennings. He was in the building with... Uh, he had gone up to the New York City uh, Emergency Response Center in Building 7. Um, and uh, uh, on the way down, uh, he met Michael Hess, the city uh, corporation lead, council, lead city attorney, uh, up there also. Uh, and they both made their way down. And as they're making their way down, the building is blowing up, um, and uh, uh, major explosions. Uh, building seven was reported to have uh, fallen uh, uh, concurrent with the North Tower. At 11 o'clock, there were reports of a 50-story coming building coming down. It was reported that fallen at, uh, having fallen at 5 o'clock by the BBC and others. It wasn't until 521 that it actually did come down. So, so. at any rate, uh, let's uh, let Dave continue. Okay. Uh, um, the um, socialist realism was uh, uh, not so popular with the new left, uh, which was people who came forward in the 60s and included an anti-authoritarian strain. Mark my words. The suppression of 9-11 truth by the left will be seen as historically as a bigger embarrassment to the left than socialist realism ever was. I want to leave you with a list of uh, major progressives who have sided with, to some degree with 9-11 truth. Michael Parenti and Cynthia McKinney lead the list. <clears throat> Professor Richard Fall. Professor Peter Phillips, former director of Project Center. Dr. Kevin Danaher of 50 Years is Enough, a Professor Peter Dale Scott, Professor James Petrus, Cindy Sheehan, Professor Michelle Chusadovsky of the Center for Research into Globalization, and uh, Danny Schechter did weigh in on our uh, website, let-the-architects-in.org, which we set up after Netroots Nation, a, a descendant of the Daily Coast blog, refused to allow us to even pay for an exhibition booth at their conference to talk about the laws of physics. Those who have passed, who have made pro-9-11 truth statements, include Gore Vidal and Dr. William Sloan Coffin, Jr. I was actually worshiping weekly with Phil Berrigan during his last few months alive, and he was sympathetic to 9-11 truth in his last days. Howard Zinn put blurbs on early David Ray Griffin's books. Um, I did a video interview with Howard uh, the year before he died. It, it may or may not be up. I could pressuring my friend to put it back up. Uh, but that, at that point, he had changed his position and it held that 9-11 truth was a diversion. Now, isn't that position equivalent to saying that it's okay for the government to lie about some things and not others? How many people say I'm being unfair to claim the phrase that 9-11 truth is a diversion is equivalent to saying it's okay for the government to lie about some things and not others? Anyone think I'm being unfair? No. No one thinks I'm being unfair. Okay. Uh, before I ask for volunteers, let me raise the position of Ray McGovern, who sets the perfect example for leftists. Ray used to be read the daily CIA briefing to Poppy Bush 
when the murder of Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Moffat was president. Ray is more of a pacifist than a leftist, but let's not be picky. Ray's position is that he does not feel truthers have made their case, but he thinks the movement makes a positive contribution by asking the hard questions it asks. Now I'm going to ask for volunteers. I'm going to be asking Noam Chomsky to publicly discuss 9-11 at MIT with me at his convenience. Who helps me want to prepare intellectually and organizationally? Okay, got one, two, okay. Um, and if you're watching this by video, there's my email. Okay, I am an advocate of suffering in jail to touch the heart of the adversary, Gandhi's approach, ignored by the present day American activists mostly. Uh, is there even one person in this audience who would even consider serving time for 9-11 Truth with me? All right, excellent, we got one. And um, again, who would like to help, uh, who would like to uh, do regular leafleting at the 9-11 Mu Memorial Museum? That's Les's email and I can hand these out. Anybody want to help us leaflet? The museum will be open forever. Okay, we got two. No, I have um, some important historical okay. information to share from the left in 9-11. All right. All right. Share that. Uh, and I got one more thing, and then I'll be done. Okay. Um, and who wants to pull together and help organize the fund of a challenging advertisement about 9/11 in major left journals? Yep. Okay. 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 Um, so thanks. Name, I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. My name's Kathleen McGuire, and I'm late to this. Um, I've been a card-carrying leftist for many years. And um, I won't say how I come to it, but about two years ago, I finally came to it. And once I lifted the bed covers, it's like, oh my God, I got the picture. And so I too have been very uh, distraught that so many of my leftist allies um, are just, this is preposterous, they won't go down with me. They've actually broken 30-year friendships. So it's been extremely emotional for me um, because I'm still a leftist, but now I have a much bigger picture. In any event, I started investigating, where did this go wrong? What? And so as I was looking into it, I unearthed some very interesting information that's just part of the historical record that maybe some of us have forgotten. I didn't know I wasn't there at the time. But back in 2002, a very critical period when the left crucially could have been there and helped um, to ask important questions, a man named Michael Rupert, who just died and who I didn't necessarily know, or and I'm not saying I support everything he said, but he was asking very important key questions around 2002. And they had him on KPFA. Um, does everyone know KPFA, Berkeley uh, Station? Um, Pacifica Station. And um, then they wanted him to do a fundraiser because a lot of people were listening. And very important three-page fax was sent to KPFA by a leading leftist um, whose name is Norman Solomon, who ran for Congress from Marin County, one of our leading leftists, uh, a little behind the scenes, not as well known as Amy. And basically in this three-page um, memo in 2002, a critical time period, he attacked Rupert um, and he said that he shouldn't be um, um, given the form to do this fundraising. And he said, for progressive media outlets and progressive movements, this kind of stuff, and he was poking, um, picking apart some of the minor mistakes that Rupert had made, is potentially very destructive. Many listeners, KPFA listeners, will be understandably put off, and as a result, some are likely to question the station's overall credibility. And such program, when successful, he, he put in quotes, encourages people to fixate on the specter of a diabolical few plotters rather than the profoundly harmful realities of ongoing structural, institutional, systemic factors. Um, so he's saying that if you focus on that rather than all of the big problems, um, when logic becomes secondary to flashy claims and when assertions unsupported by evidence become touted as hard-edged facts, any temporary sizzle hardly compensates for the longer-term damage done to KPFA standards. A key question remains, aren't the well-documented crimes of the U.S. government and huge corporations enough to merit our ongoing outrage, focus, attention, and activism? In other words, we have enough work to do, and let's not go after this. And then there was a letter um, in, in, the in 2009 
um, somebody wrote a letter to um, uh, FAIR. Does everyone know who Fairness yes. and Accuracy yes. Reporting is? Um, in 2009, somebody out of the blue wrote a letter and said, you know, what's up with you guys? It's 2009. Why aren't you saying anything about 9-11? This was Fair's response. Fair mm -hmm. is also one of our leading leftists, and Norman was actually one of the founders, as was Jeff Cohen and Martin Lee. And I, um, disclosure here, I worked for Fair the first year of their existence. And so they responded to this person's request for, come on, let's have some 9 11. In 2009, Fair said, as a media watch group, Fair and its outlets are not the place for original investigative reporting <laughs> on the events of September 11th or anything else. In terms of media uh, criticism, we've yet to see an alternative to the standard account that the World Trade Center was brought down by passenger planes that is compelling enough for us to take corporate media to task for failing to include it. And in October, two months later, surprisingly, they printed, like, they said they got a hailstorm of letters, and they printed, like, about um, eight of them, and they were all highly encouraging, people basically saying, WTF, come on, FAIR. FAIR never responded, and I haven't seen anything since. So that's sort of some key roots of where the left is in terms of squashing pivotal dissent at pivotal times. I've been in dialogue with Solomon uh, when he was running for Congress. I showed up at an event in D.C. and I was totally polite. I did not insist that he deal with 9-11 um, issues. I, what I do with people who have a serious problem, either they're a big time politician or whatever, I ask them for private time. They don't have to take any position publicly. I just ask them to look at our best evidence. And I have not gotten him to go, of course, he, he's 3,000 miles away. But I will, you know, I was always polite with him. Uh, I actually met him once by chance when I was working in the D.C. area because he's originally from D.C. So um, he is a serious problem, but I was always polite to him, so he owes me a little bit of time, in my opinion. Well, I think we should all um, uh, lobby to FAIR. FAIR is one of the leading leftist um, publications, and everybody should be writing them. Come on, where is your stance on September 11th? There's more than enough. Um, information because what Norman er, wanted to do in this letter was well we can't have all of these weird accusations but he wouldn't address the evidence all right you don't like Mike uh, Rupert's evidence then you give us some evidence you look at it wouldn't do it stuck to the middle of the road as a typical mainstream leftist yeah, thank you thank you Frank yeah uh, I don't think it's just fair it's also since we're uh, the forum of the nation oh um, yeah thank you uh, first I one think, I mentioned I think the key uh, key uh, indicator was the back in uh, Rick, well, Alexander Coburn, who's now passed away, uh, used to write a regular column for the uh, for the nation, and in one column he viciously attacked the 9-1 truth movement. That goes back to like 2003, 2004. And it was it really was a snide column, etc. There was an outpouring of uh, letters uh, to the nation at that point. And the editor at the time, you know, it's so bad with names, he's not the editor. The train. Of who? The train? No, 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 at the time. Oh, okay. Uh, a fish? Uh, fish? The fish? I'm sorry, who did the Yeah, Victor Novasky was the editor at the time. I ran into Victor at a, you know, at a private party about a year or two ago. He's now the editor of Emeritus, and uh, it, was like a, it was a film showing about, about Palestine and Israel. And I asked him about that back then, and I said, you know, you admitted, because you said it was the largest outpouring of letters to any one issue in the history of the nation. I actually printed that. And that goes back to the Civil War. The nation was printed, started, was it started printed in the Civil War. I said, since you said that, how come you never had any articles after that? And he looked at me and went, that was his answer. I <laughs> delivered, finally, a letter. They know it. They just won't do it. I, Not me. I, I delivered a letter to Katrina's hands just with, uh, a couple of months ago uh, from um, uh, Dr. Kevin Danaher, who she knows. And uh, I, I don't, she did not respond to him, so. <coughs> okay, uh, Henry, and then yeah, I uh, Henry Plansky, I work with architects and engineers from that one, truth. And I think it's important to understand that uh, certain institutions of the left, notwithstanding, um, there has been a lot of work and progress done in educating the public about money and truth. And uh, the fact is the left doesn't influence people that much, so the rigorous doesn't really count for all that money. 
Uh, Architects and Engineers sponsored a YouGov poll on people's opinion on 9 11 truth. The results that came in was that 48% of respondents do not trust the official story. With those who weren't sure, it's only a minority of the respondents who trust the official story. We, uh, we have, were able to get experts to speak out to be shown on Colorado and PBS. Uh, after it was shown, it was one of the most popular documentary of the year. I don't think it's a coincidence that the Colorado State Democratic Party has not put into their party platform a full group of investigators. The Ottawa City Council has called for a new investigation into the 9 11 Ottawa City Council has an indication. And there were NDP parliamentary members who have uh, spoken out on 9 11. And there are candidates who have sworn that in case just to be sure of Canada and candidates who pledge to raise the issue of 9 11 in the coming election. So it, the work has not been for nothing. Things are moving. And uh, again, the left notwithstanding has a whole undercurrent, a whole counterculture of understanding what happened in 9 11. And the thing really is to bring that to the surface, to mobilize it. Well, the problem that happened is so many people who would be with the left, because the left was silent, because they wanted to protect their turf, their form, and or their money, these many people went to libertarianism and Tea Party and God knows what else, and the left has lost a huge population that could have been still here with us. And that's why we're insignificant at this point. So, so uh, let me just make one correction. The Democratic Party did, in Colorado did have a platform about uh, calling for a new investigation. It was just recently removed. So, so it's uh, been removed. And I need so, to make another correction. Uh, Wayne's comment at the very beginning of having, uh, I am the first or among the first people to serve time for civil disobedience on the climate change issue in general, not particularly the North Carolina coal plant he mentioned. So, so thank you very much for attending. We're, we're a little bit, little bit over uh, time here, um, and uh, I, we ask people just to talk about 9/11. Great to meet you. Great to meet you. Uh, you're a fan.